Welcome in to the New Orleans Pelicans podcast, the official podcast of your New Orleans Pelicans, a podcast dedicated to everything you need to know about the squad. Hear from players, coaches, broadcasters, and those who cover the NBA on a daily basis. It's time to flock up. The New Orleans Pelicans podcast starts right now. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the New Orleans Pelicans podcast, the official podcast of the New Orleans Pelicans. It is back in the play-in for the Pels. We'll set that up here as well as they will take on the Lakers yet again on Tuesday at 6.30. Yesterday afternoon in the blender, Pelicans come up short as the Lakers led from start to finish. Head coach Willie Green on the loss. They played with a ton of force, and they really they came out right away and at least for that first half, they, they punched us right in the mouth and they kept going. And so, you know, we, we let a really good opportunity slip away. Zion Williamson yesterday faced a tough Lakers defense. Here's what he had to say. They got whatever they wanted in the paint. Uh, they dominated us in the paint tonight. Got to go back and watch film um, so we can really break down the details and we'll regroup as a team. Point to the paint, the big issue. At halftime, it was a 50-12 to 12 point differential. The Pelicans had 12. The Lakers had 50 points to the paint out of their 70 first half points. C.J. McCollum, as to what he saw? I think it was a combination. Um, turnovers, they got in transition. Um, some lobs, some dunks, some slips, some backdoor cuts, a little combination of everything. So now it sets up again a rematch on Tuesday, 6.30 as the seven seed and eight seed battle. The winner will become the seven seed and face the Denver Nuggets. The loser will wait for the winner of the Kings and Warriors and host that game. So if the Pels don't win on Tuesday, they will play again on Friday and host at the Smoothie King Center against the winner of the Kings and the Warriors. Obviously, you like to win. Don't have to worry about that. We'll get into all of that and more as we... Bring in Jim Eikenhoff for NewOrleansPelicans.com. There's a lot to get into here. Bottom line, if I had told you the Pels go 4-0 on the road and yet are back in the play-in for a third straight year, would you have believed me? I probably wouldn't have believed you, and I also would have been just as salty as I feel right now that it seems like hard to believe that they, they did so well on the road trip and swept those games and came up with a huge win in particular on Friday against Golden State. And, I mean, they were a possession away from being in the playoffs if the end of the Kings suns games goes differently. So to go back to your question, if you told me they were 4-0 and they and said, well, they're still going to be in the play, and I would have been – I definitely would have been surprised. And I think furthermore, if you told me they were going to win 49 games and not be in the top six, that would have surprised me as well. But, I mean, we've talked about this many times. It, it, it also goes to show – how formidable the Western Conference is that, I mean, they they literally needed to win 50 games to get in the top six and have an automatic playoff spot. Instead, they won 49. They ended up as the seven seed. So um, t- it was definitely tough. But like I said, I'm, I'm definitely a little bitter based on the circumstances of that they're in the position that they're in despite mm-hmm. having the great road trip. And, I mean, they tied for the second-best record in franchise history regular season wise, but still all of that wasn't good enough. And by the way, too, the the team that they tied that also went 49 and 33, they were also a seven seed. So, I mean, that was 2009. That was 15 years ago. But I guess they, some things never change that in the Western Conference, the level that you have to get to. And I mean, I, I can sit here and complain and moan and whatever, but the fact remains that it just shows you what you need to do to be able to get accomplish your goals in the Western Conference. And I mean, they can still make the playoffs, but in terms of the regular season, um, they had to play a little bit better to to get to that top six spot. I was going to say, when you referenced it, I, I thought about it this morning, one game. You hear that so often, right? Mm-hmm. Drew Brees for years in this building. I can't tell you how many times he said the next game is the big game. It's the next biggest game. The next game is that. Trying to stay focused, understanding that. I think you saw a clear example yesterday of a veteran team that have played one championships, whatever, at least they're mm-hmm. led in that way that understand that, that, that flip that gets switched, that understanding of it. Cause yet again, in post game, you heard sense of urgency, not matching, you know, things of that mm-hmm. nature. But Jim, that has been 
an unwanted theme this season on this team, hasn't it? Yeah. Where it could be a game on a Tuesday. Just but this time this year, you've kind of the heard thing, that a couple of times. The only thing I'll say about that, though, is I feel like sometimes we only count the losses as big games. I mean, you could say Friday they played a team that has even more experience, has even more championships, has even more guys that have accomplished stuff in the in the NBA with the Warriors. They won on the Warriors' home floor, and then they come back Sunday and obviously play the way that they did, which was really disappointing. But I, I just feel like a lot of times this season we've we've been in this mode where we only count the losses as big games. We don't count the wins that they get as significant. What I was trying to say is each game is a big game. And when you look back at the season, one game, what's sure. your, well, how big a difference is that oh, yeah. one game? And what mm-hmm. I was trying to get to is you look at games in which – you felt like you should have won games that you had leads late uh, games where you didn't score for the final 350 games where again Willie Green saying we didn't have the urgency we didn't play with the 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 yeah. uh, the, the respect that I guess what I'm trying to say is I, I think that's every team in the league though every no I hear the, you but I'm just saying it's, it's incredible as we sit here <laughs> on this Monday about to play in another play-in game, mm-hmm. how important every game is. When you think of its totality of 82 games, you're sure. like, oh, well, you know, we got time. Mm-hmm. You can get our rhythm. Jim, every game mattered. Here we are again, another season where we're sitting there with the Pels and going, if they just would have won that one sure. game. And no, it's incredible. Exactly. I mean, to your point, we, we mentioned this before. Last season, one game was the difference between the eight seed and the nine seed. They might have made the playoffs if they had won one more game in the regular season. It's Instead, incredible. they got knocked out by OKC in the 9-10 game. This year, obviously, is a little bit better position because you can still lose Tuesday and then come back Friday and win that game and go to the playoffs. So the margin of error is slightly higher. But, I mean, you're right. I mean, you go through the regular season, and I'll again, I'll re- reiterate this, that teams say every game matters but if you watch the way that they, a lot of teams around the NBA operate they don't really do that they don't when when you have games where you have a bunch of guys sitting and people kind of punt on games um it it it, it, it a lot of times it does come back to bite you um I, I don't think necessarily that was the case with the pelicans specifically but i mean you're right I, you need to have urgency every single game because i mean if it if two years in a row aren't enough of a lesson to show yeah. you that you have to treat every single game like it's important. I don't know how many years it would take. I mean, but that's I think any you. fan who sees that, if, if you've watched the last two years and seen the, the fate of the end of the regular season, you, you know by now it's like, even if it's a game in December and you're just like, yeah, well, we didn't have a good game, We but, you know, we'll get it, we'll get it, we'll, we'll get them tomorrow, we'll catch them next time. Um, this is a separate rant, but I feel like in the league overall, there's all, there's been a growing mentality towards – um, well, we'll take care of this tomorrow. Like, and, and it's it's like if we can do something today, now nah, we'll just wait till the next week or whatever. And um, it's it, I don't I don't like that. I do think that I mean it needs you need to emphasize the importance of every single game. And unfortunately, this year one game would have been the difference between the six seed and we'd have this whole week to get ready for a playoff series against I guess it would have been Minnesota. But instead, you're looking at a Tuesday play-in game, and the stakes are extremely high. That's the frustrating thing, because you just said it. I mean, that is the lesson of the season. You had to take the you have to have the understanding that every game matters, and especially as the season progressed, Jim. We're sitting here in December. We're sitting here in January. It was very easy to see this is a stacked Western Conference. Mm-hmm. This is going to come down. Look, we're not clairvoyance. I mean, I mean, you know, I'm not. I can't see through the future or anything of that right. nature. I like to call myself Gustradamus every now and then. But Jim, we sat there in January. We said you need to do this in January. Stay above 500, survive. In February, you need to do this. Like we could see this and trying to stay ahead because you knew that you couldn't afford to lose very many games. And it was baffling sometimes that, you know, those lessons maybe weren't learned. Look, I'm just going through the schedule at the very beginning to try to find areas that you're just going to sit there and you, at, at some point you kind of kick yourself, right? The back-to-back losses against Utah, at Utah, back at the beginning of the season in November. The mm-hmm. two losses against Memphis here at home when Ja Morant returned, one in overtime and one 115-113 where you literally – Remember, I think Jonas got called for the foul and the tip. They inbounded mm-hmm. it at the rim. Like th- these are things that you just sit back and go, man, 
That's one game right there. Like so sure. many opportunities mm-hmm. you could do that. And look, and then I know you don't want to sit there and go back and go through all of those, but it, it, that's the thing that that gets me is when I sit here and look at this. Every game does matter, and I guess that's the thing that's disappointing to hear a, a lot of times this season. But yeah, look, I, it is what it is I, now. I mean, you, you have to somehow figure it out. I think I'm not disagreeing with you, but I also think too that. The bigger factor to me yesterday wasn't that you took it lightly or didn't have urgency. Yeah, I don't think the bi- that the was bigger a factor was the Lakers played amazing and were the better team hands yeah. down. Yeah. And I think in some of the games that we talked about this year, where especially at home, where they lost games convincingly, and you started to ask yourself, like, okay, are they in the same um, tier of the NBA as OKC right now? Probably not. Are they in the same tier as Phoenix? Yes, they are in the same tier of Phoenix, even though they they lost those games. But some of those. I guess my point is that a lot of those games were, you might say like, they might say after the game, like, you know, we didn't have urgency or whatever, but a lot of times it's because you're playing a team that played amazing. Like Booker had 50 something points in both of those games and the competition is super high. So um, I think, I mean, one of the things that I, I thought about too in the last 24 hours, or I guess less than 24 hours is the Lakers and I would say the same thing about the Suns. If you look at just the games where the Lakers beat the Pelicans, you'd say, this is a 60-win team. If you looked at just the games that the Suns beat the Pelicans, you'd say, how are they not like the one or two seed in the league? So, and I don't want to use the word fluke because that's not that's not the, the case. But if you look at the scope of both of those teams' entire seasons, yeah. it doesn't make sense what they did in the games or, or how good they looked. But at the same time, the Pelicans also had a 20-point win against the Lakers on New Year's Eve. They also had... Um, a, a win in Phoenix a week ago that was one of their best wins of the season um, on their home floor. So it's like it's it wasn't just that. I mean, they went five and zero against Sacramento. The Lakers went zero and four against Sacramento. Pelicans went two and one against Golden State. The Lakers went one and three <laughs> against Golden State. So it's like I want I want to uh, I'm, not, I'm probably sounding like I'm trying to minimize the loss yesterday. I mean that was a that was a Super disappointing day. I understand. I mean, for me and for everyone, it was like you were so excited going into that game of what the possibilities were that you could clinch a playoff berth at home against the Lakers on the last day of the season. You have a huge celebration. None of that stuff happened because they didn't play well. But I'm, I guess part of one of my point is that, like, if you look at the whole scope of the season, I do think that some of the things that people say are a little bit misleading. I mean, you would think that based on, like I said, the head-to-head series that the Lakers won 10 more games than the Pelicans or the Suns won 15 more games than the Pelicans, but the Pelicans actually won two more games than the Lakers did over the course of the season. So I don't want to get carried away with with some of the things that we say about, like, you know, oh, they didn't take the season. I mean, you could say this. If you say this, the Pelicans didn't take the season seriously enough or certain games, you could say that to an even greater degree about the Lakers because they finished lower in the standings and the, and the Suns ended up with the exact same record as the Pelicans. Um, and like I just listed, I mean, there's a bunch of examples where New Orleans did much better against specific teams in the West than some of these other teams did. Can I Do I understand fully why the Lakers won three out of four from the Pelicans? And it wasn't just that they won three out of four, but all three wins were pretty dominating performances. I can't totally explain that. But I still think over the course of the whole season, like you could say, okay, well, the Lakers showed up in a big game and the Pelicans didn't. But it's like over the course of the season, I don't think that you could find tons of examples in the other direction, I guess. When you look at reasons, matchups, you hear a lot about that, right? Graf says it, AD says it a lot, Antonio Daniels about matchups a lot of times. This game is about matchups. And sometimes teams match up better against teams than don't. You mentioned Sacramento being one of them. I think the Pels match up uh, better against them. And when I look at this Lakers team, Jim, it's interesting because when I look at past wins to now, I was I was talking about this with Todd yesterday. I, I feel like at times in the past when the Lakers have beaten the Pelicans, it was one of those, you use the word fluke, Th- that, that team doesn't shoot threes, they knocked down like 20, right? Mm. Right? I, like, yeah. I feel like they beat the Pels and, and hurt them with their shooting. Mm-hmm. Last night was a bit different. It's more in the mold of what L.A. does best. They are one of the top teams in the NBA in points in the paint. But to have 50 of your 70 first half points in the paint, it felt deliberate. It felt a tactic. It felt like there was their game plan. So 
as Pels fans are sitting here and media members are sitting here going, what happened last night? I'm trying to find reasons and things that they're doing across the parking lot right now. Looking at film, what did they do? I thought defensively, first play of the game, LeBron's on Zion. AD's on Zion. They had a plan for that. They had somebody absolutely mirror C.J. McCollum the entire game. With the ball, without the ball. He was being face guarded. J.D. kept bringing that up in there. So, Jim, they saw what the Pels did in the four-game road trip. C.J. McCollum was on fire. Zion Williamson was playing well. They put their best players and put a plan together, and they saw the Pels playing small balls of late. It's been working for them. I think they attacked the paint. So now, now you have the chess match, right? Because, look, I, I heard Anthony Davis say it yesterday in the postgame. They looked at this and are as a mini playoff series. He mm -hmm. said that. He said that the Lakers are looking at this as a mini playoff series so they can move on and get what they need. And in a playoff series, it is the adjustments from game to game they go, right? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing on that list as far as, you know, you mentioned the points in the paint in the first half. I mean, the Pelicans, this is not a, a breaking news or any ma amazing observation, but they have to make sure that they have a lot better defensive awareness and they don't have as many cutters that are kind of getting moving along the baseline, ended up with dunks. It seemed like Hachimura had a bunch of those. Anthony Davis was getting into the paint for, like, those floaters in the middle of the lane. Um, it just seemed like, you know, obviously, I, I don't know if I've ever seen a, fi a team have 50 points in the paint in a half. So, I mean, clearly that's something that has to be addressed and something that has to be improved upon because, like you said, too, you can talk about three-point shooting all day, but if you get that many easy baskets, you don't even have to shoot threes well or shoot well overall in general if you're getting so many layups and dunks. So I would say whatever form that comes in, that's going to be something that they have to change on Tuesday because if the Lakers are able to get to the rim and get so many point-blank two-point shots, I mean, you would think the results will probably be pretty similar to what we saw on Sunday. The end of the first quarter was very interesting. I loved it. Brandon Ingram has three, feeling great. Come out to second quarter. What? Why are the Lakers shooting a free throw? What What happened Right, there? right. You know, it was interesting, too, because a few people asked me about this on X, and I was trying to explain it to them. So I wanted to take the opportunity to kind of expound more on the podcast because, as we know, there's only so much you can do in 280 characters, and people start getting confused. I start confusing myself. But basically what happened was um, the Pelicans had – a, a team foul under two minutes that I think was announced as their fourth team foul. So the, you know, the Lakers end up taking the ball out of bounds. They don't score on that possession, which is a key thing to think about as we discuss this. Um, and then they come back and they find that, that that team foul by the Pelicans was their second team foul in the last two minutes. So the Lakers should have gotten two free throws out of that. So they come back back out of the timeout. The crowd's going crazy because Ingram made like a 35-footer at the buzzer. It was a really bad first quarter, I thought, for New Orleans, but they're only down by four. Or um, And it's, it's like I was like okay with that, you know, as, as sluggish as they started. They're only down by four. They got the crowd into the game. The momentum is their way. And then come they come out and Torian and Prince is shooting two free throws, and everyone in the crowd, including the media members where I was sitting, I was sitting next to was like – did they call a technical foul? Like, why is he shooting two free throws? And so he shoots the two free throws, and you're down six. The crowd goes from into the game momentum to, like, thinking that there's, like, a conspiracy of why the Lakers were just gifted two free throws. The referees did kind of explain it, but I still don't think people understood. And I was a Have little— Have you ever seen that, though? No, I've never seen okay, that. Okay, that's right. And so it hurt. <laughs> and, and by no means am I going to sit here. I don't want anyone to think that I'm sitting here saying, like, that's the reason they lost the game or that's the reason that they got blown out. But in that—and one of the, a couple of people on, on X said this— it was a huge momentum turn at no that doubt. point in the game because it was like it kind of took the crowd out of the game. Um, a couple people I wanted to add to mentioned they were like, how come the Lakers got free throws and the ball? The ball, the reason they got the ball was because they were going to get it anyways at the start of the second quarter. So the Pelicans won the opening tip. When you win the jump ball in the beginning of the game, you get the, you, you've gotten the ball in the first quarter. You also get it in the fourth. The team that loses the jump ball gets it in the second and third quarters. That's just the, the NBA rule. So... It wasn't that the refs decided to give the Lakers two free throws and give them the ball sure out of the goodness of their their heart. It was uh -huh. just that's the way it lined up. But unfortunately, that was, I mean, 
they get the two free throws. Now they're up by six after a first quarter. I can't remember if they scored or not in that first possession, but it was like, it just seemed like it changed a bunch of the way that we looked at the, the, the game at that stage. And also too, um, another fan pointed this out and I didn't really think about it as a result of that. The Lakers really got an extra possession because they got, instead of shooting the free throws, they got the ball. They didn't score, but they still got the free throws anyways. So it was like that. It was kind of a double penalty that, um, someone asked me too, like if the Lakers had made a three on that possession or two or whatever they had scored, would they've still gotten the free throws? And I was like, that's a really good question, but I don't, I don't think they would have, but I think the fact that they, like you said, it, it's something we never see. I think the fact that they didn't score on the possession and they didn't get the free throws, the refs and the rule book was like, okay, not you, they, they should have been awarded those free throws. So in fairness, they get them now. So they shoot them with nobody at the free throw line because it's not a rebound situation. It's just can Prince make one or two free throws and then we'll continue the game. Jim, what do you think about Brandon Ingram's return? Yeah, I think he looked pretty good overall. I mean, I think there's probably a little bit of rust. I didn't think that he looked like a guy who'd been out for three and a half weeks. Um, It definitely did have an impact on, you know, for example, Trey Murphy's role was reduced a little bit, which was really unavoidable. After he was so good on the road trip, he he took eight shots in the game yesterday. I think I'd have to go back and look at the numbers, but it felt like on the road trip that he was usually taking like 15, 16 shots and was much, much more involved. So... That's something that they're going to have to figure out and and sort through. But like I said, it was unavoidable. You you have one of your best players coming back in the lineup. It's going to affect the rotation. It's going to affect, obviously, Trey went from starting lineup to coming off the bench. Um, But, I mean, to be able to be successful in the playoffs, and hopefully they will be, you're going to have to have everybody at full strength, and you're going to have to have all of your weapons. It was I do think to some extent it was unfortunate the timing of – that he came back in the the one, final game of the regular season with a playoff berth at, at stake. All right. That'll do it for Sunday. I don't want to think about it anymore. Got a big game coming up on Tuesday. When we come back, we'll break this down a little bit more right here in the New Orleans Pelicans podcast. All right, Jim. So, look, bottom line is this. 630 tomorrow, it is play-in game. Uh, against the Lakers. I mean, it is what it is. So adjustments, we kind of touched on that a little bit here as well. It's interesting. The game hadn't ended. And already, the national media. Should the Lakers lose this one? Oh, and <laughs> eight. The last eight times the Lakers have played the Nuggets. Avoid Denver, which, by the way, that's what awaits. The team right. that does win tomorrow mm-hmm. will be the second seed, the Denver Nuggets. So you have to start the you know the playoffs with them over there in Denver, place that's pretty hard to play we'll get to that when we get to that Mm -hmm. but a lot of national media members they're like you know what ad the back just rest them go out there do what you got to do they get a couple days off they get to host the winner of the kings and warriors on friday and then they get to take on the one seed a very young okc team one of the youngest i think ever to get the western conference number one seed seed. so Mm -hmm. they did get the one seed the thunder what do you make of all this Ah, we'll just, uh, you know, know, because look, it happened Sunday. There were teams like the Mavericks Mm -hmm. got beat by like 170 points. (laughs) They they clearly did not have anything to play for. Yeah, that. That, but that, that's probably the reason. I mean, it's but there were some teams I saw, like Chicago and some other teams, and like the Knicks. That there's a lot of teams yesterday, at least nationally, people believe they absolutely played for seeding rather than trying to win the game. There was a really good discussion about this on Brian Windhorse Hoop Collective podcast this morning, and if people want to check that out, I think it's worth listening to the, especially the first ten or fifteen minutes or so. And I, I put myself completely on the Tim Bontemps argument of of this discussion. Um, I want to set aside too for a second, even the the logic and the the part about you know is it better for this team to do this? Is it better for this team to do that? And just say, and I've said this before in terms of the tanking stuff. I think we need to remember like a lot of stuff is just pathetic. It's just embarrassing to talk about stuff like this and to actually follow through on some of these um, decisions or. I also think too, and man, I'm get, I've been so testy already today, Gus. But I'm going to keep continue with that theme. I feel like sometimes that, and and I'm not, I'm definitely not talking about the Pelicans or their analytic pe- analytical people at all because I think this does not apply to them. But I feel like across the league, we've we're at a point where some of these front offices are are at the where they think they're smarter than everybody else all the time, and it's like because of that, you're like outthinking yourself constantly. 
You're, you're, you're having teams make these decisions where it's like maybe on the front end of some way it makes sense. But like, I just think it's just sad. Like it's, it's, does anyone have any shame anymore? Like some of the things that some of these teams have done, I just totally disagree with. And I think the idea too, of like trying to avoid a certain opponent because you don't want to play them in the first round, but you might be able, you might be able to get them in the second or third round, but you're, you're saying like, well, we're going to get killed by them, but we'd rather get killed by them in the third round than the first round. I just think that this stuff is just ridiculous and it's, it's weasel behavior and, I just don't want to see the NBA continue on this path. And yet it's obviously totally out of my control and no one's going to listen to me, but I just want it to be stated that I just think this stuff, I keep using the P word. I just think it's pathetic. Like the way that people talk about some of this stuff in terms of why can't you just be competitive as possible? You're not going to win a championship by like shirking away, like slowly walking away from adversity or competition. I've also said this in the past, a lot more maybe in the last couple of years that sometimes I feel like the league's philosophy is getting to be like whenever adversity hits, just give up. And I feel like you can apply that to so many different situations, including this one with teams just trying to angle at the end of the season for a, sp- a certain seed or a certain opponent. I, I, I need to get you happier. We need happy. Jim. The only thing that can make me happier is tomorrow. Tuesday. A win right. tomorrow. Okay. Right. Final thing here. What? kind of game do you expect tomorrow i think i i mean i think everyone will expect a much better game i know we talked about adjustments defensive awareness is at the top of my list i also think in in the keys to the game that i'm going to list i'm probably definitely going to put reducing turnovers it seemed like that was pelicans ended up with 19 they have to cut that way down maybe even in half to not only give themselves a better chance to get more offensive opportunities, but to not fuel what the Lakers are going to do by running back at you off of some of those mistakes. I'm with you, Gus, too, in terms of what you said about the way they defended against CJ in the first few minutes of the game. Um, the Lakers definitely were the tone setter and the uh, the aggressor in the first few minutes of the game. And when that's the case, when the other team comes out that way and you start making mistakes, you start making bad passes, there was a bunch of just – really costly, inexplicable bad passes by New Orleans in the first quarter. That was really hard to overcome, and as we saw, they ended up going down by 32 points. And um, I just don't think they ever recovered from the beginning of the game. But to go back to your question, I think it's going to be a much more competitive game. And think about this, too. As angry and as testy and as surly as I have been in the last 20, 30 minutes, think about how the players feel right now and the coaches feel. So... I'm expecting them to come back Tuesday with the same kind of energy that I have right now and, and make it a more competitive game. Yeah, Jose Alvarado was one of many players in the locker room yesterday that expressed a little um, unhappiness with the way that game went. So I do expect it to be a lot more competitive. And here's the other thing. I'm not using excuses. I'm just being factual. The Pelicans played three games in four days, two of them being on the West Coast, two of them being on a back-to-back, two of them being against teams that are currently in the play-in. They're good, the Kings and the Warriors, and you had to face the Lakers. So all three teams that you faced those three games in four days had something to play for and are good. The Lakers played two games in five days, Mm -hmm. and their two road games are separated by a 45-minute flight. I'm I'm just saying... You saw a team that looked a little fresher yesterday. My wife, who never goes to games to see some in person, she's always at home watching the seven-year-old. She was sitting there watching, and in the first quarter, she texted me. She goes, they look tired. Mm -hmm. In that first quarter, to your point, it's easy to fly around defensively for the Lakers when you have fresher legs. In the third quarter, I felt the Pels picked up the intensity, and you kind of saw a little bit more of what I think I'm going to see tomorrow. And that's because you just kind of maybe woke up and just you got you know the juices going a little bit. I think in that first quarter, as Willie Green said, you got punched in the mouth. They came out there a little bit fresher, and it was just enough to set that tone, which goes back to your point in the end of the first quarter. They made that a, a closer right. game there, and, and it's three. Mm-hmm. The crowd's going into it. You're down three, you know, five, and then four, four. Yeah. Same thing. <laughs> That's my yeah, point, no, though. I'm, then, yeah. I'm with you, Gus. Um, I mean, Friday to me was Friday took a lot to I mean, get. You're that down win. 13 at halftime in today's NBA. That's nothing, right? With the entire right. third and fourth quarter to go. No, I think Friday's game at Golden State was 
it took a lot for the Pelicans to get that win. After and the then, win against and, Sacramento. And I think, right, yeah, for sure. And then after you win that game Friday, you're you're this close and you're watching the game in the locker room of the Kings and Suns thinking maybe we're going to be in the playoffs before you get to even get to Sunday. Didn't happen. That's not an excuse at all. But I'm totally with you. I'm, I'm on board with your point as far as, like, that road trip took a lot. It, it, I mean, to be able to go 4-0, and and we didn't even get into much about how they started with the Phoenix game, which was a, a momentous effort as well. Yeah, It was tough. I mean, I don't want to bore people with details, too, but I think they ended up getting in at, like, 10 o'clock Saturday because they had issues with the plane. So, Again. I mean, that was about the shortest amount of time to get ready for a game that you could possibly do. At the same time, you're a professional, and if they tell you that the game is four hours from now, you're going to have to figure out a way to get ready to play it. Jim Eichenhofer, give him a follow over at Jim underscore Eichenhofer over on X. And, of course, Pelicans.com. We'll see you on Wednesday as we talk about the Nuggets and the Pelicans in the first round of playoff series. (laughs) You agree with me? That sounds like a great plan to me, Gus. Let's see if it can be executed. (laughs) Let's do it. Thanks for tuning us in. We'll see you next time on the New Orleans Pelicans podcast. Thanks for listening to the New Orleans Pelicans podcast. Join us three times per week on Pelicans.com, the Pelicans mobile app, the iHeartRadio app, or where you get your podcast. And be sure to give Jim and Gus a follow on X at Jim underscore Eichenhofer and GCAT underscore 17. We'll see you next time right here on the New Orleans Pelicans podcast.